It's your fault. You created them. The Dark Gods. They feed on the very worst parts of you. Obsession. Despair. Manipulation. Rage. You have destroyed us. They will destroy us. It's all our fault. Come with me, let us stride forth on a journey and delve into the corruption of chaos. It's warping of the material universe, its effects on your mind and your body. If you like what you see and hear, please subscribe to appease my god, the algorithm, as well as the amazing channels that have lent me their aid on this journey. The road to hell is a series of small steps all adding to the path of damnation. So come with me, and let us step into hell together and witness the corruption of chaos. They called my father the Lord of the Red Sands. For a time, they loved him. He was the undefeated. His triumph rope grew long. He became the slaughterer of nations, the eater of cities and then of worlds, with us at his side. Some even dared to know him as the Red Angel. But those are not his names, none of them. He was little more than a slave who became a butcher, but a butcher who was crowned a Primarch, and a Primarch who was turned into a monster. In spite of it all, we loved him too, for a time. My father's name is Angron. In these increasingly rare moments of clarity, between the blood rages and the infinities of pain that seem to burn his skull, from the inside out. The name Angron is all that he has left. That and nothing more. For I suspect he no longer recognizes the creature he sees reflected in the pools of spilled blood around the creaking, shifting throne that we built for him. We have only his pious, self-righteous brother Lorgar to thank for that. And one day, we will. Once terror has burned and the War Master's claim to the throne proven just, the Legion will fastoon the new Imperium with the skulls of Lorgar's sons, the treacherous word bearers. We will kill them, maim them, and burn what remains. Perhaps then our father can find some small measure of peace to carry him through eternity. Am I like him? Do we walk the same path? Maybe. I know that I am marked by something. Its eye is upon me. The same sleepless and unwavering eye that has watched my father all his life, no doubt. I can feel its malignant glare burning unseen in the heavens with the intensity of a supernova. The eightfold heat washes through the base of my skull, prickling the flesh between my shoulders whenever I rest. The echoes of its half-remembered name ringing inside my skull. It watches everything. It sees all that I am and everything I can never be. Khan, 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 betrayed, kill them, maim them. Would that I were judged for my atrocities. 
I could answer to those in a heartbeat, and spit upon any who would say that a legionary's rightful role is not that of an attack dog. Rather, I know that I am to be condemned for whatever vestiges of mercy and sane thought I can still muster, when the killing is done and the butcher's nails sated. Such things as mercy and sanity that have no interest to whatever it is that lurks beyond. And peace for my father's soul is not something that concerns it one bit. Burn them, burn them. The darkness retreats, the brain fire cools. What? Blood, blood, and pain, and nothing more. Rage, a sin, an uncontrollable explosion of energy sprouting from hate, frustration, fear, injustice, and many more sources. It is this emotion that has coalesced into the malignant entity in the warp known as Corn, a patron of war, anger, murder, and blood. Blood for the blood god, skulls for the skull throne. Worship of this entity is exclusively on the battlefield. Worship of Corn is purely through bloodshed, either from one's enemies in victory, or one's own earnest struggle. For it is not just murder and mayhem that is a facet of Corn, but honor, martial prowess, and self-improvement. Schemes and manipulation are acts that lack honor, and are despised as weakness by Corn. In truth, Corn despises all weakness, and countless numbers of warriors test themselves against the strongest combatants the universe has to offer. All of this anger, hate, war, and honor has coalesced into the dominion of Corn, a hellscape to fury and violence. If you were to find yourself lost in this corrupted space, you would see a blasted wasteland split by great crevasses and canyons many miles long and unfathomably deep. Further in this realm you find mazes of bone, a testament to the innumerable casualties of the Blood God's wars, filled with the enemies and the unworthy's remains, oceans of slick, boiling blood, vast numbers of raging volcanoes, pulping sulfuric gases and ash into your lungs all leading to the vast structure of brass and a throne of skulls, a true mountain of near countless dead filled with human and xenos alike. This entire realm is the manifestation of pure hate and rage, a distinct feeling that no matter what you say, you have felt before. When cornate corruption seeps into your very being, it is those emotions that are heightened to excess. We have all felt an injustice against us, the powerlessness, the hate we feel when those people hurt the ones we love. With the effects of cornate corruption coursing through you, this rage is taken from a cold disdain to an inferno, exploding into violence as a wash of hate consumes you and all fear is expunged from your body you are completely overtaken by bloodlust. The desire to spill blood for the blood god is overwhelming, and when you finally reach the temple of Corn, the battlefield, you are a mix of rage and euphoria as you destroy all before you. But the problem with such an exalted high is when it's gone. It is typical of some of the followers that in the absence of battle, they suffer jittering twitches and headaches, and worst of all, anger and hate is a poison, and the effects of holding onto it for so long is soul destroying, a constant chase for that battle high release, again and again. The corruption of chaos on your mind is great, but for those that surround you, it is the physical transformation which is equally haunting. Starting from the smallest transformations in cultists of corn, you find that their features are exaggerated. Muscles bulge, skin pales, sometimes teeth become elongated. Corn does not give his blessing easily, for you must prove yourself hundreds of times over. For those that succeed, 
the blessings increased to diabolical physical strength, a resistance to psychic powers, as well as a cracked visage of bleeding gums. For those that are truly monstrous on the inside, and have spilled enough blood for the blood god, they are filled with even more corruption, becoming closer to the red demons of the warp, such as with Angron of the World Eaters, who upon his ascension to demonhood, he became a monstrous red-muscled, winged monstrosity, covered in scars and wounds, with a face like a snarled animal, and a body that pumps roaring hot blood, butchering friend and foe alike, the imagery of hate personified. At last, Phosis Dakar hammered his way through the golden warriors surrounding Rus and laughed as he saw their terror of him. Their leader turns to face him, and Phosis Dakar relished the look of disgusted hatred he saw. Dark hair spilled from beneath his red plumed helm, and Phosis Dakar saw he had the eyes of a killer. Faldor, hissed Phosis Dakar, the word slithering and wet. Constantine Valdor held his long-bladed polearm before him. What are you? he bellowed. And Phosis Dakar laughed at the foolishness of such a question. I am your death, he boomed. But the words were mangled and distorted by the twisted shape of his mouth. Phosis Dakar loomed over the chief custodies, and only now did he feel the changes wrought upon his body. His flesh was a riot of form and function its every organ and limb reshaped by a madness of transformation. Flesh and armor ran together in a hideous meld of organic and inorganic material, and the bubbling meat of his body seethed with unbridled ambition. How could he not have noticed such a profound change? The answer came to him as soon as a question formed in his mind. His flesh was no longer his to call upon. Eutypia's presence filled him. His hateful relish and patient malice unlocking the rampant potential locked in his genetic makeup. A wild and untamed transformative power that had laid dormant and contained within him was now given a free reign, unleashing nearly two centuries of change in as many minutes. In Valdor's eyes, Phosis Dakar saw what he and his legion had become, and he knew that his fate had always been theirs. Valdor came at him with his guardian spear aimed at his heart, and Phosis Dakar finally understood why his Primarch had chosen not to fight. Monster! cried Valdor, driving the spear into his mutant flesh. I know, said Phosis Dakar sadly, dropping his weapons and closing his eyes. The golden blade clove his heart, and death was a welcome release. Manipulation, a sin, an expression of the desire to change the fate of you and others. It is this overwhelming emotion that has created a dark entity deep within the Immaterium. Zinch, the changer of ways, a patron of sorcery, knowledge, scheming, and most importantly, change. Zinch is empowered by our desires for evolution, improvement, innovation, and progress prosperity and ambition, traits that can seem noble, whose very application has led to great progress within our world, leading to things that we take for granted. All of this evolution, this change, powers this foul entity within the warp, but taken to the extreme is what turns this emotion from an ember into a raging inferno of fuel. Zinch is known as the Great Conspirator, and works to corrupt the aspirations and ambitions of mankind and Xenos alike, manipulating and playing with the various threads of fate. Of all the landscapes in the warp, the changer of ways domain is by far the most bizarre and incomprehensible. A labyrinth of crystalline structures, lights of every color, some even unseen in the material universe, springing from the shifting walls. 
a place that would shatter the average mortal mind as travelers of this plane view all nine dimensions simultaneously. Past, present, future, hot, cold, far, close. This is a domain ruled by constant change and fluctuation, all an expression of the corruption of Zinch. But how does this affect you? What would happen if you were to be involved with the corruption of that foul warp entity? Zinch was created and sustained by the desire for change, an essential part of nearly all sentient life. You've had that feeling before, the need to improve your mind, your body, the circumstances of your life. Improvement is a healthy goal, but when the influence of Zinch seeps into your soul, this feeling is taken to zealous heights. As the great conspirator, Zinch is aware of all the dreams and plans of mortals. With corruption coursing through you, your mind is changed, as you now have an insatiable desire to manifest your dreams and plots. Knowledge, power, and exploration, it is never enough. Secrets must be uncovered, power must be created, plots and schemes woven, all a means to a future in your favor. It is easy to see how many acolytes and sorcerers consider Zinch a patron god, as they delve deeper down the proverbial rabbit hole of forbidden knowledge. For those that embrace it even deeper, they are cursed or blessed with the visions of the future, blessings of forbidden knowledge, but coupled with the madness of someone who had seen too much. An example of this lies with the demon prince Magnus the Red. His soul is deeply corrupted by Zinch. Magnus, in his court placed in the ruins of Tiska and the Warp, has his mind filled with forbidden knowledge and power, but he is prone to ramblings, as he views the various fates and schemes in his head. In his presence, he would seem quite mad. The boons of Zinch are a curse and a blessing to your mind, but the changer of ways corruption also extends to the body. As the warp corruption seeps in the willing and the unwilling, they experience the true power of change. In the worst of cases, such as with the Thousand Suns Legion, they suffered the flesh change. The victim is overwhelmed by Zichin power, and they transform into a hideous monster, driven by madness to endless acts of depraved violence. The body grows vast with layers of muscle and sagging flap enveloping the contorted skeleton and rapidly mutating organs within. Limbs elongate and multiply, fracturing along their length to allow for new movement. Claws and bony protrusions sprout from deep within. For those that can wield the power and the favor of the changer of ways, they may be rewarded with mutations that will benefit them. All the way from extra eyes to tentacled limbs that can aid in sorcery, to becoming a lord of change, an immensely cunning and powerful warp creature with shimmering skin, wicked curved beaks, and multicolored, spectrum shattering wings. For those that gaze upon these twisted prisms of pure magic, they begin to feel their sanity shred and their reason begins to slip away. You can become a being that is the pinnacle of manipulation, knowledge, ambition, and change. He felt the sting at the back of his left knee. Something had opened a minuscule hole in the flank of his ceramite. Hatred filled him as quickly as the flies filled his armor, biting at him, devouring all ability to think or reason, as he fell into the mindlessness of fighting simply to prolong the inevitable. He swung his thunder hammer wildly, until he felt the pushback of another power field repelling it. The flies parted just enough that he could make out his foe. Dark green armor, red pauldrons. The eye slits of his helm were a T-shape through which no face could be seen through the darkness. The presence spoke to Clavum, 
and he somehow heard him through the buzzing, comprehended him through the pain. Let your raging hearts be still, brother, for you have found love. Clavum grit his teeth, the filthy, greasy, hairy things infesting his ears, his nostril, his mouth disgusted him. Yet the madness finally made sense with the words of the stranger. Be free from pain, brother. For Nurgle cherishes you. He felt his strength return, the stinging of the flies melting into pleasant, tickling sensations that caressed his raw flesh. Be free from loneliness, for you carry your children within your armor. The creatures burrowed and nestled within him, filling his entire body with blessed warmth. Be not an orphan, for Nurgle is father to all. Those words lifted Cavum's heart as his soul was washed clean of bitterness built over centuries of thankless labor. He saw then the true reason his chapter knew not their primarch. The truth scoured away any shred of loyalty still spitefully clinging to his mind. Dismiss not the mortal, for all are one with the plague, father. Cherish them as your children and reap the love of Grandfather Nurgle in turn. Clavum lowered his weapons as the flies cleared, which allowed him to see the guardsmen standing once more, dancing in a ring around him. His brothers were also blessed as he was, cheering and singing joyously in the purity of decay that permeated their beings. His adopted children too joined the song by buzzing within him. Through them, Clavum felt Nurgle himself speak to him. Casting aside his instruments of death completely, Clavum threw his hands to the sky in reverence as he made his proclamation in union with all his brothers, cousins, and children to their one great father. Despair, a sin, the source of power for the dark entity known as Nurgle. You cannot deny that you have been overcome by despair at least once in your life. Was it because of insecurity, denial, or possibly the fear of danger affecting someone you care about? Despair is defeat, a cry of your soul when all is lost. In life this feeling ebbs and flows. However, it is Nurgle who takes this to extreme depths. As a patron of this feeling in the warp, Nurgle manifests this despair in the form of disease and pestilence. The desperate, dying and diseased feel despair on a level beyond others, and this is when they are at truly the lowest point that they come to Nurgle to find alleviation from their pain. Paradoxically, this patron god of despair, stagnation, and disease does not grant devotees death a release from their suffering. Instead, Nurgle provides not redemption from their ailments, but rather comfort within their suffering. For something to die, it would be change, and it is stagnation that powers the plague father. For in a strange perspective, Nurgle is also the embodiment of life. For regeneration comes from decay, just as hope springs from despair. The manifestation of the corruption of Nurgle is a mind-bending, putrid display of these emotions and traits. In the realm of the Plague Father within the Warp, you will find a truly disgusting place of disease, decay, death, and rebirth. This nauseating realm is home to every pox and affliction imaginable and is alive with a stench of rot. This 
garden. It's not a wasteland, but rather a twisted paradise for death and pestilence. As you enter, you would find buzzing swarms of black, furry flies littering the sky, and molded, twisted flora and fauna, with rivers of pus and defecation. Smells and sounds that seep into your body, pumping in that very feeling of despair, a place of revulsion personified. But what happens when that overwhelming corruption starts to crawl its way into your mind? At first you are overwhelmed by crippling despair. Your mind turns inwards as you see any beacon of hope inside you extinguished. You are disgusted as you see your body start to decay and rot. As the corruption finally washes over the last remaining parts of your soul, the change happens. Whereas once you might have begged for death, now you are overcome by acceptance. The universe is a rotten place, full of pain, but with the grandfather Nurgle, you see a sense of comfort. Despair is replaced by disturbing jovility, like a madman who understands that nothing can hurt him in his mind palace of madness. Where there was once disgust at the sight and smell of decay, disease and rot, it is replaced by morbid fascination. As with the corruption coursing through you, you can now see the true beauty of rebirth and life in the corrupted flora and fauna and bacteria Nurgle offers. The problem with all this joy is that now you are filled with the desire to spread this amazing gift, seeing the cries of victims as gratitude rather than agony. The corruption of Nurgle is strong on your mind. But perhaps amongst all of the dark gods, the followers of Nurgle show the most vivid corruption in their body. As the influence of Nurgle washes over your body, you become a swollen, walking bag of pus and putrence. Your skin swells and rots, all the way to the bone. You continuously leak organic fluids, infected with every disgusting bacteria, virus, fungus and infectious agent that can be conjured by the imagination. From the lowliest cultists that springs forth boils, sickly complexions and putrefying bone or horn, all the way to the level of a demon prince of the plague father, who have monstrously sized forms, sometimes resembling creatures such as flies, maggots, rats and many others, such as with Mortarian of the Death Guard, who possesses giant moth wings, surrounding his tainted husk of a body. A tall, enduring, hulking form awaits all the followers of the Plague Father, though the reality of this warping is you become a rotten form that reflects the heart within, a corrupted image of despair and death. She was suddenly very aware of her body, the same vessel of flesh that had served her for so long, but one that was very changed from its original form. Her fingers were too long, jointed in many places like spider's legs. Her face was like porcelain, with wide gleaming eyes and high cheekbones, running up into a forehead split with a ridge of hardened skin that ran back along like a grossly distended skull extending back for a full meter. The blades of her pelvis flared like petals of bone, curving up from her waist, and her spine was greatly elongated with hundreds of vertebrae that writhed of their own accord. Her skin was decorated, not with anything so crude as tattoos, but with elegant spirals so faintly etched that they were only visible to someone who concentrated for many minutes on the play of light against Lady Cherubdia's body. Very few people, however, would dare stare at Torvindis's ruler in such a way. The thought pleased her. Hundred strong gangs sweated in the infernal heat and darkness of a rock face, from which jutted stone claws gnarled in death and spikes of still sharp steel. The slave's limbs were corded with muscle, 
but their faces were drawn with fatigue. They were of all species, legions of indistinguishable humans, massive orcs, monstrous ogrens, even a few shackled monsters from the alien fleet that traversed the cold space between the galaxies, goaded with the shock flails to tear the rock with their claws. Most had been captured from the peoples of Torvindus, who had at one point been in Lady Charybdia's way, with the others brought in by raiders throughout the maelstrom and handed over in tribute. But none of them would live one-tenth of their normal lifespan. The lucky ones dropped dead of exhaustion or were crushed by chunks of fallen bone. Those who did not try to flee would be butchered by the guards who stalked them. The guards missed nothing. Their outer layers of skin were paired off so that every breath of air was a raw wind of knives against their raw nerves. Every movement was like a radar blip of pain in their minds. And besides, the smell was wondrous. She reached out with her senses, and the scent of despair filled her. Thick and purple, hot inside her head. It was the first she had discovered, back when it seemed the galaxy itself was young. She had never tired of it. They knew they would die, one way or another, and it was not just fear, but an utter lack of hope. The smell of abandonment and tragedy. Obsession. A sin. A source of vibrant emotion, whose very ripples have created the Prince of Pleasure, the Lord of Excess, Slanesh within the warp. Have you not suffered the vice of obsession? Perhaps you got carried away. You just wanted to perform better. You wanted to feel better. Perhaps you wanted to be perceived in a better light. It is when this journey for improvement is taken to unhealthy heights that it empowers the dark god Slanesh, a patron of pleasure, excess, decadence, lust and pride. This foul warp entity is the manifestation of the selfishness of the mortal races of the galaxy. But yet on the other side of that coin, Slanesh is the personification of excellence and perfection. Do we not lord the beauty of this world? Do we not celebrate the magnificent pieces of art and culture produced by humanity? Does it not move and motivate you when you see something truly magnificent and incredible? It is Slanesh that promotes this very excellence. A patron of the finest arts, martial prowess, education and experiences of pleasure. To be the best. To be talented and successful at the things we care about is an ambition shared by nearly all of humanity. Unlike the rest of the Chaos Gods, Slanesh welcomes those that try to enter its realm. The corruption of the Prince of Pleasure manifests as this insatiably beautiful but yet horrifying vista, ranging from fields of shimmering gold, forests and fauna that shimmer with beauty music that plucks and pulls at your most treasured emotions and the smells of perfected wines. But yet this is intermixed with the mangled corpses of victims, contorted into displays of twisted art, landscapes twisted into forms that evoke a cruel, excessive sensuality, choirs of screaming, tortured victims, all leading to a chorus of pain, pleasure and exaltation. The smells that fill you with a mix of blood, perfumed fragrance and aphrodisiacs. At the very core of Slaneshi corruption in the warp, it leads to the Pleasure Palace, a temple to the extremes of luxury, pain, beauty and pleasure. But what happens when the influence of this foul warp entity creeps its way into your mind? It is often those who are consumed by their own obsessions that understand that feeling of being lost in their own world. A place where only what they want to achieve exists. When Slaneshi corruption seeps into this feeling, it is taken to an even higher frenzy. The desire to push further and further consumes you. Your obsession paired with the drastic increase of vanity and ego, 
for are you not the most talented and most deserving, where there was once a disgust at the sight and sounds of haunting decadence. Your perception is shifted and you begin to enjoy it. Your mind races as the very extreme taboo experiences now fill you with comfort and excitement, but that eventually becomes a problem as the high you chase begins to give diminishing returns. To those deeply affected by Slanesh's corruption, each decadent experiences eventually becomes normal, mundane, and you are now stuck on a never-ending chase of that experience of beauty and exaltation. But it is not just the mind that the Prince of Pleasure corrupts, as the body is equally twisted into forms that evoke shock to us. As the corruption of Slanesh invades and tangles its way into every cell of your body, the change begins. You begin to feel your senses heighten, smells, sounds and taste is refined and increased to superhuman levels of sensitivity. From the lowest servants who show small levels of deviation such as paling skin, dilating pupils, horn-like protrusions and elongated features, escalating to those who receive the blessings of the Dark God and mutate even more horrific features such as chitinous claws, fanged teeth, lapping tentacle protrusions, all designed to enhance their experience of pleasure. All this corruption crescendos into the demon princes of Slanesh, such as Fulgrim of the Emperor's children, possessing a towering four-armed form, joined to a snake-like lower half and wings, crowned with elongated horns, exuding a presence of hedonism and arousal. It is this final form that is the visual representation of a heart polluted by vanity, selfishness, and obsession. Terror gripped Invictus as he looked down at the circle beneath his feet. Eldritch light was beginning to emanate from the carved runes, dancing and gambling, flashing green and blue and red. Now you will learn what it is to be among the doomed ones, continued Lord Cathal, taking a step backwards. Now malice will show you what your victory was wrought. Invictus tried to speak, to demand to know what was happening to him, but he found his jaw would not move. The words simply would not come. The whisper of the librarians rose, as did the Vox units, and they soon reached a crescendo. The light at Invictus's feet grew brighter, lashing upwards to sting his legs and bathe him in its iniquitous light. You are truly worthy, Invictus of the Suns, Cathal screamed, raising his arms to the shadows of the rooftop. Can you hear him calling? He has come to accept your tribute. He has come for the Labyrinth's Eleven. He has come to walk among us. Invictus followed Cathal's gaze, lifting his head to the ceiling. Through the shadows he could see the outline of something huge, something that stared down with baleful eyes, something wicked in the dark. He screamed, screamed for the pain that engulfed his body, screamed for the terror in the depths of his soul. But no amount of screaming could halt the ritual now. It began to descend, pulling with it the dark and the pain. Invictus raised his voice on a last tumultuous cry as his flesh began to flay from his bones. As his body was consumed, he realized that not even the kindly release of oblivion could save him now. In the great hall, all was silent. The sons had watched as the light consumed the body of their brother Invictus, along with ten other heroes of the labyrinth, their limbs immolated, their torsos eviscerated, their heads contorting and twisting, writhing within a pool of black light. And what stood before them was no longer their brothers. Invictus and the rest were gone, gone to join the ranks of the legendary Doomed Ones. What stood before them was the revenant they had worshipped for millennia. 
the Eidolon, that would stand at their vanguard as they retook what was rightfully theirs. He could only be summoned by sacrifice, only by giving on to him their best and most praiseworthy warriors could he walk among them. And there he stood, gazing with eyes of fire, the renegade god, the outcast, the lost, hierarch of anarchy and terror, Malice. It is our greatest sins that have coalesced into foul entities within the warp, four dark beings that call themselves gods. They spread their influence and corruption to the mortal races of the galaxy, doing what is deep within their nature, destruction. But there is more that resides within the warp than just the dark pantheon. There are other malicious entities, ones that take the title of minor chaos gods. It is the sin of anarchy, the desire to aimlessly destroy that has coalesced into the foul warp entity known as Malice, also known as the Outcast God, the Lost God, and the Renegade God. Malice is the embodiment of indiscriminate destruction, rebellion, vengeance, and complete and utter anarchy and self-hatred. Malice appeals to the nihilism that pervades much of humanity, the apathy and inevitability of losing all that you care about. The nature of Malice's powers is parasitic. As the renegade god grows in power, only when the other ruinous powers do. As uniquely amongst its brethren, Malice is the enemy of chaos at all times forever. No compromise or temporary peace can be brokered with the renegade god, for as a patron of anarchy and destruction, Malice seeks to destroy the other chaos gods, as well as the material universe. It is this desire to destroy the evil that are the dark gods of chaos almost gives Malice the perception of noble qualities. As a minor chaos god, the knowledge of the domain of Malice is a complete mystery. Though it can be theorized as an entity that reflects rebellion, the corruption that seeps from him may affect the world in contradicting ways. Or perhaps in that very defiance of chaos itself, the renegade god claims no permanent domain, as to do so would be an affront to its ideals. For those that are unlucky enough to come into contact with the corruption of this foul entity, you will suffer. At first, it is those filled with self-hatred that malice latches to. For when you experience loss or failure, your frustration with yourself is dialed to 11. You begin to see the world for what it truly is and what it always has been. An unclean, tainted place that does not deserve to exist. Rather than a spark, an ember of vengeance is accentuated small and burning, it is existence that deserves punishment, all to please the great lord, Malice. War with chaos is a visceral and haunting experience, the screams of cornate berserkers, the chants of the thousand sun sorcerers, the maniacal laughing of Nurgalite demons, the cries of pleasure from the emperor's children. For the followers of Malice, Battle is enacted in cold, unnerving silence. Only the roars of bolt of fire can be heard, for even the way they wage war is in defiance of the other chaos gods. Rebellion, anarchy, defiance, malice. But the renegade god is not alone, as there have been rumors of other minor warp entities such as Ansel, Morok, Firaz Etar, Dark names that some say are tied to the mystery behind the unique corruption that has created the Chaos Raptors and Warp Talons. Corrupted space marines that have become addicted to the thrill of looking down upon the battle beneath them. These corrupted marines have melded with their warp gear, becoming truly able to fly. Becoming a Chaos Raptor means your blood becomes high-octane fuel that runs throughout your body and war gear alike. 
Your eyesight is so sharp you can pick out prey from several miles away. This unique corruption has molded your body in such a way that you prefer to stride on all fours like a predator. The corruption can even become so deep that elite warp talons can move through the veil of reality and slice between dimensions. Whatever is responsible for the origins of this corruption is unknown, but its consequences is a being that personifies absolute dread. Chaos. Lorgar tasted the word, weighted on his tongue. That is not the correct word, is it? The immaterial realm may be one of pure chaos, but it is changed when bonded with the material universe, diluted. Even in this great eye, where the gods stare into the galaxy, physical laws are broken, but it is not a place of pure chaos. It is no random ocean of seething psychic energy. It is not the warp itself but a meshing of here and there, the firmament and the ether. The Primarch breathed in the ashy air, feeling it tickle the back of his throat. Perfect order would never change, but pure chaos would never rise in the first place. You desire a union. He turns to Ingethel. Blood ran from both of the demon's eyes now, darkening its fur and bleak lightning streaks. You need us. Lorgar said, the gods need us. They cannot claim the material realm without us. Their power is strangled when they have no prayers or deeds offered in their worship. Yes, but the need is not a selfish one. It is a natural desire. The gods are masters of chaos as a natural force. The warp is every human emotion. Every emotion from any sentient race made manifest into a psychic tempest. It is not the enemy of life, but a result of it. Chaos seeks symbiosis with life, the ensouled and the neverborn in a natural harmony, union, faith, power, logar, immortality and endless possibility, sensations beyond mortal comprehension. The ability to feel maddening delight at any agony. The gift of ecstasy, even when you are destroyed. Making even death a great joke. Knowing you will incarnate into another form over and over until the suns go black themselves. And when stars die, chaos still lives on in the cold. Still perfect, still exultant, still pure. This is everything humanity has ever dreamed of. To be unchallenged in the galaxy. To be omnipotent above all other life. And to be eternal. Lorgar would no longer look at the fallen city. You have chosen poorly. I am pleased and proud to have discovered the truth. I am honored to be chosen by beings powerful enough to be considered divine. By the truest meaning of the word. But I will struggle to bring this light to humanity. I cannot win a war against the god sat upon the Terran throne. Life is struggle. You will strive. And you will succeed. We are all the protagonists of our own story. On a hero's journey. Some just trying to survive. All the way to those seeking to build a better world. A future where our enemies are vanquished, but you are just one person, and the fantasies of changing the world by yourself are a lie, and deep within you know this. As an individual we are powerless, and that very feeling leads us to seek out things that fill us with comfort, fulfillment, and power. In the grim dark future there is a revelation awaiting those that delve into the power offered by the war. The reflective dimension of sentient emotion, a truth, a faith that can fill the void of powerlessness. This is the primordial truth, to see that there is a pantheon, each god part of a whole, universal truth, chaos undivided. Each of the chaos gods are an immensely powerful warp entity, 
embodying the various excessive emotions of us, ruled by their own nature and their desires, and their actions are often contradicting. But when they are aligned, they create chaos, a dark concoction of the powers and corruption of all four chaos gods, sentient malevolence personified. When chaos pierces the material universe, we see the effects of pure chaos corruption and all that it comes in contact with. Be it flora or fauna, it is twisted into ways that reflect the ethos of destruction and hatred. Growths of crags, spikes, fire, horn, and many other discomforting protrusions spring up. The lands bend and break with a myriad of effects similar to the traits of each chaos god. But most importantly, it is the warping of the laws of physics that is the most notable trait of chaos undivided. Distances seem… wrong. You could walk for years and never move closer to your destination, but yet also take a single step and cover vast distances. Time is also corrupted to a mind-numbing scale. Real-life experiences and perceptions are altered. Objects may dissolve or rust within an incredibly short period of time, but could also experience little to no time at all. Something could have been lost for thousands of years, and yet be unfettered. In truth, it is madness and hell, spread into every cell and particle beneath your feet. A change that will bring you dread. But what happens when the corruption of the pantheon undivided flows in your veins? For those that are unwilling, it is a forceful crushing of your sensibilities, almost like a shattering of ignorance as you begin to see the truth, the magnanimity of the dark gods. Whereas each chaos god is the embodiment of a set of negative emotions, you are filled by all of them. Your rage, despair, obsessions, your manipulations are all dialed up, neither one being dominant, but yet all being accentuated. For those that are willing servants of the dark gods, the mental transformation is less of a sudden change, but more of a comforting acceptance. As with the traitor legion the word bearers, to them the acceptance of the primordial truth and the dark pantheon is just a fundamental destiny for all. The gods are coming to claim humanity and offer their worthy immortality. How could something that offers such a gift be so evil? It is this one last sin that is truly why chaos is so evil. Self-righteousness. The belief that you have the answer to a better universe alone and you will destroy all who will stand in the way of utopia. The effects of chaos on your mind are drastic but this also applies to the body too. It sinks its way in. You find that power floods your veins. It feels good. Small mutations begin to crop up. Protrusions of horn, extra limbs, and scarification. As you progress further down the rabbit hole, you may find the favor of the dark gods. The blessings increase, and your body starts to swell. Claws and hoofs may grow as you start to become more similar to a Western Christian depiction of a demon. But for those that have earned great power, they are blessed with demonhood. Such as with Belakor, the demon prince of chaos undivided, the corruption transforms you into a literal demonic beast. Wings, a gaping maw, and diabolical strength is all that is left of you. Perhaps it is intentional that the Champions of Chaos Undivided look so similar to their original form. A statement of the union of your soul and chaos, the best of both. Chaos. A force of destruction or a gift of immortality. It is all a matter of perspective. But there is one truth in the end. It is a cult. Hiding truths from the masses, forceful conversion, and extreme practices. But most important of all, it reserves its boons for a select elite few. The corruption of chaos may grip and turn you. You may receive gifts and powers that you never dreamed of, but there is one fatal flaw amongst all the corruption of the chaos gods and the beings of the warp. Immortality. A never-ending existence of beings that you are enslaved to love. The corruption of chaos, its gift. It's salvation. 
is a joke. We can't save you all, but we can save those who are worthy. We have seen the primordial truth, the only salvation for humanity. You will understand, when you see the gods, you will understand.